promise that this is going to be an integral and an extremely enriching synthesis of the multiple perspectives. And there is a reason why the people who you see on the panel are there where they are. Because uh, the question of Indian genesis and, and you know, the idea of the topic itself sounds a little biblical, biblical but uh, the, uh, the word genesis also means regeneration. It also means coming forth. It is not just about the point of origin, but it is also the point of uh, ever renewal. So the attempt today is to understand, like I said, the complex uh, alchemy that is the Indian identity. And genetics is one perch, while the immediacy of the Aryan debate will de definitely focus uh, our attention on the politics and the narratives of that. And we will not shy away from talking about it. Uh, but it's also important uh, because my, uh, my attempt, and uh, I know talking uh, with the Samvad team, our attempt here uh, is to make sure that we develop the ability to engage in complexity thinking. The world that you are going to enter, all the students who are here, is not going to be simplistic, uh, simple, narrativeless world. In a lot of ways, I think my generation has made it complex for you. So we also owe it to ourselves and to you to try and give you the means to uh, decode and work with the complex world. And to do that, knowledge is the only ally. And to actually engage in a complex debate like Indian genetics or the cultural identity conversation that you're going to see, or to understand the territorial uh, security issues that we have, uh, it is critical that uh, we bring with us not just the uh, curiosity, but also the ability to develop the intellectual rigor. I think it's Einstein who said uh, everything should be made simple, but uh, no more simple than what is possible. So while the genetics debate and the genesis debate is an interesting, multidimensional, complex one, and we will definitely attempt to bring out the multiple perspectives and I have a great panel to do that for us today, I would urge that we take a real keen intellectual interest to understand what is at stake here. What is at stake here is not just some academic research, while that is the place where knowledge uh, comes to us from, uh, the debates and the ramification of the debate uh, spawns the entirety of our existence. When you think about the, uh, you know, the recent conference about eradicate Sanatana Dharma in Tamil Nadu, some of you must have been engaged in the debate. It's a, uh, it's a very provocative statement and somebody saw it fit to make that statement, uh, of course, on an admittedly political perch, uh, but there was currency for it. What does it really mean? Because then it's pound a debate about what is Sanatana Dharma? What is the idea of eradicating that? And these are narratives, whether you like it or not, uh, whether it is a technology institution or whether it is a humanities and social sciences course, you will get enmeshed in. And the questions about identity almost are thrust on you. And that was uh, possible because there is a certain historical account of India's evolution that has not been owned by India. And while parts of our reclamation look ugly, look uh, a little amateurish at, time, at some times, it is of high integrity. It is of existential importance. So my attempt today is to engage all of our panel members uh, in the research area that they focus on. And I would try and synthesize what this debate means to you and I, uh, making it uh, as accessible as it is uh, you know, possible, but at the same time also urging you to use this as a forum to launch your own investigation into your identity. So with that, uh, I have a certain sequence in mind for this and we have a certain format in mind. Uh, like uh, the introductions read, each of them have a lifetime's body of work uh, in a very specialized, very niche area. So we'd like to first listen to the latest and the, uh, and the most important and profound aspects of their research and their thinking currently. I'm looking forward to this rich, complex uh, synthesis on a issue of, uh, to me, nothing less than national integrity. I'll begin with uh, the person on the right, uh, and not because I'm most familiar with him, uh, but because uh, he serves the purpose that I have in mind about uh, the rich synthesis and uh, getting a multidimensional perspective about identity, particularly from the debate on genetics together. I've been, uh, I've been fortunate to listen to him and learn from him about uh, India's civilizational history, starting from the Vedic, Rig Vedic period to the contemporary debates on uh, genetics. Uh, I'd like Amrit uh, to talk to us about his research and uh, how do you locate the debate of India's genesis and uh, where are we, what are the important questions? Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.
My study has always been into ancient Indian history. Uh, like so many of us, I grew up listening from my grandparents uh, and my relatives the glory of uh, ancient Indian past. Uh, that cities like Banaras, cities like Prayagraj are some of the most ancient cities in the world. Uh, then I got educated uh, and in school I was told that all of this is a fib, that all of this is mythology. So essentially my study was trying to figure out whether I've been lied to. And in that study, uh, I discovered that yes, I have been lied to, but not by my grandparents, uh, more in fact by my education. What I discovered were a number of key points. Uh, all of this, of course, uh, will hinge uh, in this discussion today around the matter of Aryan invasion, migration, trickling in, uh, what we may call it. But that is one arc in the longer story that brings us here of Indian Genesis. So when we think of Indian Genesis, the Rig Ved uh, in its first sukt itself, it refers to the Rishis Purve Bhi Nutaner Ut, which means the Rishis who are old and new together. Therefore, in its earliest arc, the Rig Ved is alluding to its own past. In Mandal 10 in the Rig Ved, uh, it's the Rishi, the Drashta, he says he is singing old songs, Navio Uvachi, in a newer speech. And by Mandal 10, we find names that are ancient history even for the Rig Ved, Prithu Venya, Vaivaswat Manu, and other such names. So this tells us that what for our civilizational thought may sit at the source of Praman, which is the Vedic corpus, in its own time was already part of an entrenched continuity. So what does that continuity look like and where could we trace that continuity back to? This has been my study. And of course, it ties up well with everything else that our tradition may tell us from the Puranic evidence, for example. Because in the Puranic evidence, when we link it to the Vedas, the Rig Vedic period happens in what we know as the seventh Manvantar, the seventh epoch of man. But the Purans do tell us of six prior epochs. And the Purans are not just a garbled mess of mythology. One of the key things to internalize when we speak of Indian Genesis or of any human collectives world over, human beings do not just cook up fiction and pass fiction by the campsite. When they sit and tell stories to their children, they are informed by real events. They are informed by kernels of truth, which gain embellishment, which gain corruption, which gain distortion, which lose memory, but the kernels remain. Now the Purans tell us of the various stages of human development. They tell us that first human beings lived in the forest. They had an arboreal living. Then they tell us a next stage came when human beings moved out of the forest, started living in the plains, but here they were met with predators of all kinds that did not know before. And so they went into the caves, they went into the mountains. The Purans even tell us that at this stage, human beings were still eating untilled grain. They were subsisting on raw grain, raw berries. Then comes a time when human beings come out of these caves, come out of these forests and learn to till the grain. Finally, various types of settlements emerge. Ghoshas, which are wandering settlements of pastoralists. Vasatis, which are metro cosmopolitan settlements. Settlements owned completely by farmers who own the land and settlements owned by people who till the land but do not own it. Now in this four stage process from the forest to the city, we find the entire macro historic history of humankind itself. And at this stage, we are not making any untenable claims. All we are making is an observation that look at the remarkable amount of macro historical memory entrenched in the Purans. Further, it is not just historical memory. It is actually introspection on that memory because the Purans at various places list domesticated animals to us. And in that list, last on the list is always Manushya. So it reflects the awareness that every stage of development we have made has come with a Faustian bargain. And no matter where you date the Purans, that awareness is still dated to an ancient time. So when we think of Indian Genesis, we are thinking of the origins development and trajectory of the various strands of thought 
and ways of living that coalesce at the time of history when recording is available to us into what we may call Hinduism, into what we may call Vedic India. And that genesis for us, the information for that is available in our own historical record. Of which, of course, then the Aryan invasion, migration matter, uh, it comes at some point in that history to bring up new debates. On that debate, of course, uh, we, I should cede more territory to Dr. Elst. But what I have learned uh, from his works, from the works of Talagari, sir, that, uh, sir, if I may take the liberty of paraphrasing you as well, the existence of Indo-European languages outside of India merits an explanation. It deserves an explanation. So it is not enough for us to just refute the matter of Indo-European origins and dispersals. If at all, we want to play on the world stage. If at all, we do want to assert our history, our track record, then we must explain the existence of Indo-European languages. And then we must have a viable out of India model of Indo-European linguistic origins and dispersals. And there, of course, uh, Dr. Elst will speak. And I have been informed by a lot by the works of Talagheri, sir. And those things we can come to. But that's how I see setting the stage. Thank you. Hand it over to Dr. Els now. Sir, you've been uh, pressed into debate uh, by a recent Wire article once again. Uh, and this time we are told that there is a Nazi uh, dimension to this as well. Uh, what's, uh, how do you uh, trace the evolution of your own uh, research? And you've been, uh, you've been tracing the Aryans for quite some time. Tell us what the latest on this. Well, I remember in my young days writing an article setting out the usual Aryan invasion theory. So I'm a convert from the Aryan invasion theory. And in fact, most pro out of India scholars are converts. Now in the new generation, there are many who have never known anything else. But for us, the Aryan invasion scenario seemed obvious. We didn't know anything else. Now in um, the uh, 80s, it started, uh, people started to doubt. And so what came about was not yet the out of India theory, but the non-Aryan invasion theory, or, or rather the Aryan non-invasion theory. There had been an out of India theory before, that's like more than 200 years ago, when the language family Indo-European was discovered in 1667 then the first explanation was the out of India scenario. And so not just these ugly, vicious Hindu nationalists that are blamed nowadays. Uh, no, no, the, the top thinkers of the European Enlightenment, like uh, Voltaire and like Immanuel Kant, proposed the out of India scenario, said explicitly European civilization stems from the banks of the Ganga. This is literally what Voltaire said in about 1770. And so for about 50 years, the out of India scenario was the dominant one. But so around 1830, 1840, this starts to make way for peri-Caucasian scenario, either north of the Caucasus or south of the Caucasus west of the Caucasus, but always in that neighborhood, so out of India. So all these different homeland scenarios amount to the same thing, namely immigration into India. Back then they candidly said invasion. Nowadays they are all squeamish about this. They, they insist that you say Aryan immigration theory. Uh, that um, has two reasons. One is simply the spirit of the times. You see, invasion is something military, something, you know, toxic masculinity. And so that's like not fashionable anymore. But there is a more pressing practical reason. It is that if there had been an invasion, a military invasion, a conquest, we would have seen quite a few signs of that. And the archaeologists would have discovered mass graves and burned cities and so on. Now, we do find these, but not in India. In Europe, there has also been an Aryan invasion, or rather, 
over there, there has been an Aryan invasion. You know, around uh, 3000, there was a strong demographic concentration of Indo-European speaking people in what is now Ukraine and southwestern Russia. And so from there, they invaded Europe from about 3000 BC onwards. And that you really notice because you see a complete uh, new pattern uh, that is archaeologically identifiable, new pottery, new grave styles, new housing styles, and so on. So you see a new population has arrived. And you also see it, it's not just that they changed their, their styles and so on. No, no, you see that it's a real new population because nowadays it can be confirmed with genetics. And you can see that among the male population in Europe, there has practically been a genocide. They've all been uh, killed off in battle. The women have survived. They were, as it goes in those situations, used as uh, breeding cattle. So they have survived or their genes have survived. At any rate, there you do have an Aryan invasion. There you can see what an Aryan invasion must have looked like. And it's completely absent in India. And so because there were no signs of a military conquest, they perforce had to retreat to the position that, oh yeah, they must have moved into India under the radar. Somehow they, they took over the largest civilization existing in the world at that time, larger than Egypt and Mesopotamia combined. They took that over. They imposed their language, their religion, and yet they left no trace. See, that's fairly uncommon. So there was, um, now you see with archaeological and then finally genetic advances, there was doubt about the, uh, there arose doubt about the Aryan invasion theory. A cutoff date is 1984 when the American archaeologist Jim Sheffer declared very explicitly and openly, there is no evidence at all, nothing at all has been found to substantiate this fabled Aryan invasion that we all talk about. Then earlier, two years earlier already, there was a book that did not have such influence, but that nevertheless, looking back, was equally important, namely by K.D. Setana, a Parsi who had been the secretary of Sri Aurobindo. And so in very high age, he wrote this book in which he shows that uh, cotton, in Sanskrit karpasa, had not been mentioned in the Vedas, but had been present, had clearly been known by the Harappan people in their urban phase from 2600 onwards. So he concludes the Rig Veda is earlier than 2600 BC. This was at a time when everybody thought that the Rig Veda begins after 1500 BC. So in, 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 in the whole uh, evidence debate, you see, this is a very crucial given that the chronology of the Rig Veda pretty much decides the issue. Uh, all the uh, invasionists assume an invasion in about 1500 BC after the genetic findings by David Reich, it has gone up to about 1700. But so this is based on an estimate made by Max Müller. In India, many people claim that Max Müller invented the Aryan invasion idea. That is not true. It was already there for a few decades. But what he did was to propose a date about 1500 BC for the invasion of India for the Rig Veda even later, like 1200 BC. Now that was based on nothing. Max Müller was a very big name at that time in Europe, well known far outside the academic world. And so when he spoke, few people dared to go against it. Among specialists, among his own circle of colleagues, there, yes, a few people did point out, yeah, but this estimate is not based on anything. 
and a few people like his own pupil, uh, Moritz Winternitz, pointed out that actually to cram the whole evolution from the Rig Veda to, let's say, the Buddha in just a few centuries, that is not realistic. You know, the Vedas must be like the third millennium BC. But so that upsets the whole picture because then the people back in Ukraine, you know, must have lived earlier, but then the invasion in Europe must also have come earlier and so on and so on. You know, so that, that upsets the whole theory that gradually has taken shape. Um, so the doubts that were voiced by Winternitz already 140 years ago, they now get more, let's say, let's more flesh by new types of evidence in genetics and in archaeology. Uh, so we are at a very exciting stage in this debate because, and I'll end with this, uh, in the West also, strong doubts have now come to light about the established scenario. And uh, this comes under the influence of genetics, but also by linguistic developments. And so you will probably hear of a paper by Paul Haggerty, uh, one of the leading linguists at the moment, where he proposes on linguistic grounds that the um, homeland was not north of the Caucasus, north of the Black Sea, which is what the established theory says since the 1920s, but south of the Caucasus in Armenia, northern Iran, which is where David Reich on linguistic, uh, on genetic grounds also locates it. And so now there is a, a massive shift in opinion to that area south of the Caucasus. So that's already outside Europe for the chauvinists among you. It's already certainly in Asia and it's already a lot closer to India. And so if there had been an invasion, then they didn't have to go all around. You see, some people must have gone north to, to north of the Caucasus and there uh, settle in Ukraine and from there enter Europe. And those were the European branches, uh, Germanic, Celtic, Slavic. But the rest stayed down south, and so it is from there that they entered India. Now, uh, some people will say, yeah, that's what we always said. This has to do with the theory that Meyergar, uh, a Harappan city, but all the way to the west in Baluchistan, that that was the first in India to have agriculture and that that fits into a scenario that agriculture came from West Asia. And so this now would correspond with the arrival of Indo-European languages from West Asia. However, to that, you see, and here the debate restarts. You know, meanwhile, there have been many indications that agriculture was independently invented in India also. In fact, it was invented independently at five different areas on earth. Uh, but so I, I, I leave it here. So the debate is very much going on. You know, let nobody tell you, not even any of us, that the debate has been settled, that now finally we know. On the contrary, it is a very exciting time. The debate is in full swing. We'll hear more about it. I'd like to have one question. Uh, yeah, and, and before I summarize what we've learned so far, because there's already a very, very rich body of information that uh, we have to really understand. Uh, but you, you began by locating the, uh, the fact that the out of India theory was already an accepted theory during the Enlightenment area mm -hmm. uh, in Europe. What prompted them to relook at that? What is the intent as we are aware of? Yes, in India, of course, you have to go against the very common opinion that this was all uh, colonialist concoction and racist and so on. You see, these concerns were, of course, there, but they do not explain the evolution of this theory. It's, it's the other way around, you see. Once the theory was there, then politicians saw what they could do with it. So in, in the case of India, of course, if the Aryans had come from outside, then the British could say, for example, Winston Churchill explicitly said it. We, the British, have as much right to be in India as anyone there 
because they're all invaders. And so, but that came afterwards, you see. So to answer your question, there were several uh, linguistic considerations. The two, deci the two decisive ones were the fact that Sanskrit was not the mother language. It was already a daughter of a proto-Indo-European language that has disappeared and from which all the other branches also come. Uh, then the second is so-called linguistic paleontology. That is to say, from the vocabulary of an ancient language, you can deduce what kind of reality they lived in. Like let's say in, in Congolese, you won't find words for snow because they never have snow. Now here, what they found was that you, you find a few typically Western European elements like the beech tree, which you find in France mainly. And then you have many words that point to a Northern climate, like the bear, the wolf, uh, the birch tree, the uh, otter and so on. Now, what they didn't sufficiently realize, at least not in Europe, those who go against it were Europeans settled in India. Like, for example, the arch-colonialist Mount Stuart Elphinstone. You know, he wrote after his time in politics, he settled down as a historian, he wrote a history of India, where, you see, then the out-of-India theory is, is, is declining. And so he defends it. He says, you see, there is no testimony in Indian scripture of any home outside India. You know, it is not, uh, not logically, it is very uh, special pleading to forcibly want them to come from outside India. So some people defend it, but you see at that time the arguments are too strong. So people don't realize that there are bears and wolves and otters in India too. And that even in hot countries you have islands of cold climate, namely near the mountains. But you see, what helped mainly is a non-linguistic argument, namely a literary argument. Then the first translations of the Vedas are made. And so they look for historical information in the Vedas. And there are a few battles, especially the well-known Battle of the Ten Kings. And there they read, at least in their understanding at the time, that there is a description of white people uh, overcoming dark aboriginals. Now that's a bad translation. Um, uh, first of all, there are a number of details that, that plead totally against it, like the Aryans come from the east and the so-called aboriginals come from the west. That's already not exactly as it should be. And um, then there is a translation of the enemies as the black people. Now, sometimes the enemies are called the black people. That's not a mistranslation. However, you see, what does black mean in the context of war rhetoric? In the Second World War, the Allied people called the people on the side of the Axis blacks. Um, in British security reports, Subhash Chandra Bose has a Japanese collaborator is systematically called a uh, black. Okay, so black as, as a negatively connoted color is the color of the enemy. And um, that's in general, that's true in a, a, a few descriptions of battles. In the Battle of the Ten King, Kings, it's, it's even worse. You see there the enemy is not described as black. The, you know, it only seems so. The enemy is called the Asikni Jana. So the Jana is the people, the tribes. But Asikni can effectively mean black. But now if you read closely, that's not what the word is doing there. Asikni here refers to the black river. You see, it's a normal thing for rivers to be called the yellow river, the dark river, and so on. So here you have the Black River, which is that the Chenab in West Punjab. And so the, the battle is taking place on the Parushni, which is the river just east of the Chenab, so that's the present day Ravi, now on the, on the border of India and Pakistan. So it was 
5,000 years ago, the first Indo-Pak war, won by India. And um, so uh, Sudas, the Vedic king, is uh, pushing to the west, to the Chenab River, and his enemies are coming from the Chenab River. So Asik Nijana means the people from the Black River, the people from the Chenab. So here it's just a mistake to say, oh, these are the black enemies. So here you have, you have a you know, cosmic mistake, you know, just a, a silly translation mistake with such enormous consequences. Thank you so much. Uh, the reason I asked that follow-up question, breaking the sequence that we had in mind, was to help us appreciate the different contours of this debate. And for those of you who are interested in this, uh, Amrit has painstakingly put about 100 papers from all points of debate on the Aryan invasion question on our website. We'll share the link later. But I want us to actually quickly reconcile what we've already heard. There are contestations about origins. There are stories about origins. There are historical accounts, but it is a multidisciplinary field. We need to approach this question from at least five or six central disciplines. There is history and there is a professional uh, process of recording and understanding history. There is linguistics, there is archeology, span there is of course the emerging field of genetics and there is the field of uh, you know, oral culture and culture plays a role in all of this. So for those who are looking to understand this question of identity and find out why is this eradicate Sanatan Dharma uh, you know, a call? And what is the historical logic for it? What is the battle of narratives playing out in the everyday life that we see? And relate to the professional discipline-centric approach and the rigor that we need to understand the nuances of this. We need to get into all of these complexities. right? And that also gives me an opportunity to get into the niche areas. We've already looked at the macro of how to understand. Amrit has helped us understand the question of Puranic narratives and why they are critical and how is civilization established and how does civilization flourish. LSG has given us the entire contour of the Aryan debate and that has been his lifetime's work. And he's given us the disciplines to, as the purchase to look at this debate from. Now we get into very specific purchase, genetics and archeology. span And we have stalwarts, sir. Sir, I'd like you to help us understand from that perspective, what is the latest uh, in your research that we should understand about Indian Genesis? Uh, first, I would like to thank these uh, organizers for inviting me uh, to this uh, great institute. This is my first visit to IIT Kharagpur. Now, my journey is, uh, you know, starts from Deccan College. I joined this uh, institute in 1977 as a student, uh, postgraduate student, and retired as a vice chancellor of this university. And uh, let me tell you that you know, Deccan College is the best institute in the world for archaeological research. It is not only that you know, we deal with the you know, excavations and the generation of the data, but we have basic laboratories in Deccan College uh, for undertaking basic research, scientific research in the field. Because of that, you know, we were able to achieve what we could. Now, I began, you know, my uh, academic career, in fact, in you know, Maharashtra itself. I worked on the early farming settlements in Maharashtra. And my, one of the aims was, of course, you know, we had clear-cut idea about, you know, the lifestyle of the people because, you know, we had done a lot of excavations. Uh, but, you know, we had no answer, in fact, for the origin and development of the farming communities in Maharashtra. And you know, when we did some deep research, it was revealed that, you know, that, you know, there is no, in, in fact, no evidence for the origin of these you know, communities here. So what we get, in fact, is the uh, sudden induction of uh, the technologies there. So it has come from somewhere. So then, you know, I started looking at, and then from Maharashtra, I went to Gujarat, because, you know, we have some early sites in Gujarat. There are Harappan sites in Gujarat. And uh, there, of course, you know, in Maharashtra, the beginning of maybe uh, settled life goes back to around 2000 BCE, around 4000 years old. In Gujarat, it is still older, maybe 4,000 BCE, 6,000 years old. And then you know, I got some link, in fact, you know, that uh, people from Gujarat you know, started, maybe people or the cultural elements, 
technology you know, you know, began to move from Gujarat to Maharashtra or you know, other parts of Deccan. And uh, also, you know, we did not have sufficient evidence in fact Gujarat. So then I went to Rajasthan. I, I excavated one site called Gilun. And uh, there, in fact, you know, we got you know, very strong evidence about the local origin of the uh, farming communities going back to 5000 BCE. And then, of course, you know, still you know, there was some impact from the northwestern region. So I went to Haryana in 2006, finally. And then, of course, you know, till today, I'm working in Haryana. And you know, I started the work at uh, the site of Farmana. Uh, which is uh, roughly 30 kilometers away from Rakhigadi. I'm sure that some of you are aware about the location of Rakhigadi, which is in the Hissar district of Haryana, almost in the center. And that is located in the, in fact, in the uh, disappeared or dry Saraswati Basin. Saraswati Basin, you know, Saraswati River has been properly identified. A lot of, you know, research has been done. Archaeologists have worked there geologist, hydrologist, and recently even ISRO has uh, also produced, uh, you know, a good piece of research on that. And they have constructed the whole course of the river Saraswati. And, you know, we have also, you know, you know, synthesized the data with the literary sources. We have a lot of data, in fact, a lot of mention about river uh, Saraswati in the Rubidic takes, maybe 71, 72 two times. And, uh, the text also mentions about you know the geographical location through which this river flows. So clearly, you know, we could identify that. And uh, you know when we publish our research on uh, archaeogenetic research in Shale in 2019, there are two criticisms. One is that you know, that some people say that you know, because it was published in 2019 when BJP government was in power. So a lot of people started saying that this is a politically oriented research. You know, that is one comment. It was circulating very strongly. And the other comment was, you know, we have a DNA from one skeletal remain. How can we use that for the, you know, generalization? So these are the two comments I would like to make, you know, maybe explain, you know, these two issues to you. One of our aims, in fact, at uh, Farmana in 2006 when we started the work. I always wanted to know, in fact, you know, who are the Harappan people? Because there are always debate. A lot of people say that you know, the, you know, the Harappans came from outside. And some of us, in fact, always believe that you know, they were the indigenous people. And this narrative was you know, fostered very, very strongly by the Britishers, the colonial historians. Because you know, when they came here, they gave the impression to the whole world that you know we have come to this you know, come to rule this country because people are backward here, barbaric, and we want to civilize them. That was the narrative that spread. But when you know the excursion started at Harappa and Mohenjo-daro in 1920s, a very advanced civilization was unearthed. Even Europe did not have such an advanced civilization. And then, of course, these colonial historians are a great you know problem to explain, but how to justify our rule to this you know, country. And then they started saying that, OK, you, know, we have the, you have the remains, but the people came from outside. And that is how you know, they started you know, this. You know, and you know, they wanted to show, in fact, you know, that you people are not capable of this type of developments. Only you know, we have come from outside, people have come from outside, and they have done the development. And you know, for the last so many years, Nobody has, you know, nobody tried to generate scientific evidence in this particular respect. I never spoke about Aryans or, you know, this, you know, about this theory. Never made any comment till 2006, till I started the work at uh, Farmana. And I realized, you now when I say that I miss, you know, that is my team. You know, it was a, you know, very, you know, maybe multi-institutional, multi-disciplinary work that, you know, we have done. And there were a number of, you know, primary institutions involved. Deccan College is one of them. Then CCMB, right from the beginning, was attached to this research. And of course, Professor Ganeshwar Chaube and the group from maybe Estonia. You know, all these people, you know, were also part of this, you know, maybe larger part of the uh, team that we had. 
let me tell you frankly that when we started the work, one of the objective was to extract DNA of the Harappan people. I thank the Harappans because you know, they started burying the dead bodies and they had a separate graveyard. So where they used to bury the dead bodies. And this tradition, as a Professor Conrad has mentioned, that this tradition starts from the Mehergarh, in fact, you know, which is maybe around 7000 BCE and continues into the Harappan period around 2600-2700 BCE. Only difference that, you know, the early people buried the dead bodies within the settlement, either below the living floor or in the courtyard, whereas Harappan had a separate graveyard. And right from the beginning, people believed in second life because along with the dead bodies, they buried a lot of goods, the pottery which contained food and water. We have established that scientific, scientifically. And their jewelry, sometimes their tools. So, so certainly they believe second life also. Getting DNA in this environment is very difficult. Extremely difficult because the soil here is very, you know, adverse. It is acidic soil. And the climate is not really good not conducive for the preservation of the organic matter overall. So very difficult, in fact, to get DNA. But still, you know, we started this, you know, international research, in fact. That time, you know, some uh, scientists from Japan and, and USA, they had joined us. But, you know, we miserably failed that time. I admit that frankly, because we were not prepared for the ancient DNA research that time. We had no idea, in fact, how to do this or how to go about we started excavating, excavating the burials the way we used to excavate, you know, you know, conventionally. And then, of course, you know, uh, we excavated, you know, 70 burials that time, 70 skeletal remains. We tried very hard to extract DNA, but we failed. And then we realized that, you know, that, you know, that we had kept this burial open for almost two months because our objective was very, you know, you know, different point because we wanted to come, you know, we wanted people to come and see and you know that, you know, there should not be any misunderstanding. So we kept them open and maybe, you know, whatever DNA was there that got lost. So that was a mistake. Secondly, you know, that, you know, that time when we started the research, the DNA science has had not advanced the way it has advanced now. And that was, that time it was very difficult to distinguish the ancient DNA and the modern DNA. And DNA is so sensitive that it can get into ancient DNA easily because, you know, we are excavating the, you know, remains. So naturally through, you know, maybe breathing, etc., that can get into ancient DNA. And that was all contaminated. So we miserably failed there. Then in 2010-11, then I came in contact with the scientists from Seoul National University, Seoul National University Medical College, which has got one of the finest forensic science department in the world. And they explained that, you know, that, you know, we have to change our methodology. And, you know, then, you know, we started, you know, adopting a new, uh, you know, methods for the excavation. So we started uh, using the PPE kit and uh, to make sure that, you know, there is no contamination impact in the ancient, uh, you know, burials or ancient DNA. Then also, you know, we, uh, you know, we targeted one burial at a time. We excavated one burial. We documented that immediately, and immediately, you know, we you know we pick up the samples and sent to the laboratory. So we did that for you know all the burials, and you know nearly 60 burials we excavated. And then, of course, you know we started you know the analysis. So we analyzed 59 burials, and we did not find anything. In one burial, we found some trace of the East Asian people. And there was no way, in fact, no, because the Harappans had never contact with East Asia at all. And then, you know, we started investigating how that, you know, that has come into the Harappan uh, burial. And then, you know, we realized that in spite of taking all the precaution, using PPE kit, masks, hand gloves, one of our students was from Korea and his DNA got into the Harappan DNA. So how sensitive it is, I just want to do, you know, stress upon this. And then, you know, our strategy was, you know, very simple, in fact. Initially, you know, we wanted to do this research in-house. In-house means within the country only, because we have the scientists, we are archaeologists, very, you know, competent, you know, you know, scientists here. 
So we decided that you know that you know this entire research will be done by the Indian scientist, and uh, we started analyzing the data, and maybe you know in 2015-16, in fact, we got some you know good results. We interpreted that, and we were ready for the publication. But then you know we realized that you know, if you publish now, these Europeans will start criticizing, or the Americans will start criticizing because. This is the research you now we have done. We are we are doing for the first time in fact in, these, in South Asia, and they will find some fault. Maybe they will say that this is, you know analysis is not done, that you know part is not done. So when then we decided to involve this you know scientists from outside. So we prepared three libraries of the samples. One we of course you know we analyzed that sample. The other one was given to the Korean scientists, and third one is to David uh, Rick's you know laboratory in Harvard University. And initially, we told them that you know that you just do the cross-checking for us. But then, you know, by that time, the science had developed, and some more analysis were done. In fact, in uh, Harvard, you know, in this medical university uh, laboratory. And you know, when I got when we got the results, you know, which are complementary to what you know we had achieved in fact, and then only you know, we published that in 2019. Now, this was an exercise like you know. You must have heard about, you know, the story of, you know, Howell Carter. He went, you know, in search of the, you know, Tutankhamun's tomb. And till last day, you know, he did not find anything. And he was about to abort that, in fact, next day. And next day, he stumbled upon that very important discovery. In fact, he discovered that Tutankhamun's tomb. So something like that, you know, in, in 59, we did not find anything. And we thought that, you know, there is no way that you know we can study this particular aspect because the climate is very different very adverse we may not find any evidence but the last you know this uh, late you know we always say the la lady luck so the last skeletal remain was of a lady around 30 to 35 years old and there you know we got a very strong authentic dna and then of course you know, that was analyzed say you know those who understand the population you know genomics even one DNA from one skeletal remain is good enough to understand you know, the, the composition of the population or the DNA. It is like you know, testing rice. When we test you know, whether rice is cooked or not, we pick it one grain. It is like that. So that criticism also you know, has you know, not much uh, you know, uh, footing. Because, but still, we feel that you know, we need more samples, of course. This is just beginning. And what we are getting, in fact, no, we are not reached to the conclusions. We have reached to the tentative conclusions, and we are getting indications. So that indications, I am going to tell you know, what this is what you know we have been discussing. So the analysis, you know, analysis, you know, in, is indicating that uh, we have also used the you know this uh, genetic chronology to understand the roots of the you know Harappan population. So it is going back to almost 12,000 12, years, or 10,000 BCE. In 10,000 BCE. There were hunter-gatherers, you know, maybe somewhere on the border of Afghanistan and Iran. So they broke into two groups. One came to South Asia, and one went to Iran. So those who went to Iran, you know, they started getting mixed up with the Anatolian people. And the people came to South Asia. Their genes, you know, started getting muted. And, you know, it, you know, it formed a distinct gene in South Asia. And then, you know, that, you know, the genes, you know, which uh, developed maybe around maybe 8,000, 9,000 years ago, the same genes continue into the Harappan people. And then, of course, you know, we also did you know, the analysis of the modern people. Maybe we choose roughly 3,000 people. We included all the known different groups in South Asia, 140 different groups, people from different you know, religious background, linguistic background, all were covered in this. And what we notice, in fact, at the end of the study, that most of us, from Andaman Nicobar till Ladakh and Kashmir, and from Bengal up to Afghanistan, we are yet to study, in fact, you know, the northeast region properly. So most of the people living in this area, they are the descendants of the Harappan, because we inherit, inherit you know, very strong Harappan genes you know, among us. So this is, you know, one, you know, indication that, you know, we have got. 
second in a way also studied you mentioned about the out of india uh, hypothesis theory see uh, most of the you know archaeologists british archaeologists particularly sir mortimer wheeler for example he always believed that the harappans were the dravidian people he used that you know that term i don't want to discuss you know how that particular term has come to come into existence and he said that you no know, the aryans came from outside and they destroyed the or they killed harappan people they pushed lot of them to south india and he used you know the data from the site of mohenjodaro which is in pakistan today because in the upper street of mohenjodaro you know the archaeologists had excavated number of skeletal remains just lying in you know, a helter and skelter in the in the street and we said that look this is the evidence of the people who were killed the harappans who were killed by the invading aryans and that is how you know the you know he started using he said that you know this is the scientific evidence and then of course you know subsequently this particular you know study you know this particular remains were studied scientifically by one very well known physical anthropologist kenneth kennedy from usa and kenneth kennedy's you know results are quite different but you know he said that there are no injury marks on the body of the people most of them were found in fact in the flood deposit so probably and the river indus has a history of floods which is found reflected in the archaeological data also because there are some flood deposit in the site of mohenjodaro and three events have been properly documented two events happened when the harappan economy was booming in fact now it is very strong and last flood happened maybe around 1800 1900 bc when the harappan economy started declining so previously harappans could redevelop the city but the last flood was very you know damaging and lot of people may have killed in fact you know there are two hypotheses that perhaps these people must have been killed uh, due to suffocation because of the flood, of the flood and the other hypothesis is that perhaps they died because of some you know epidemic like you no know, this covid not covid that time but like something like this so clearly you know that these people were not killed in part in any kind of you know skirmishes or battle that is quite clear so it you know automatically you know this evidence goes against the theory of uh motive revealer and you know uh, as i say that you know, a lot of people say that people came from outside the so called aryans came from outside they may be you know from europe maybe to central to a steppe region from iran to india that may be one of the routes the data that you know, we had was substantiated by the analysis from some sites from iran and central asia so we chose one site in iran the name of the site is shari sokta which is contemporary with the harappans we that site was excavated by the local archaeologist they found lot of harappan material there indicating strong contact between harappans and that region and the other site you know which was excavated by the local archaeologist in turkmenistan gonur that site also indicated you know the contact with the harappans lot of material you know was found there and then of course they had also skeletal remains the data was analyzed and what we found you know there was an indication that you know the, the harappan genes are found in them but not their genes but you know strong genes were in fact in the harappan population so that indicates that you know perhaps the harappans you know began to go out first and then there was a reciprocal movement happening up to that because of that you know a lot of you know more people started coming from central asia up to 2000 bce so that is the indication that you know if anybody believes that you know there were aryans then we the indians were the aryans and we started going out that is the indication that we are we are getting so this is scientific data that you know what we have i am just telling you about that so this this type of research is required in fact as i mentioned that you know this is just a beginning and we are trying you know planning more research you now because we have not really understood the composition of population even at rakhigri also because there may have been different groups so we need to collect you know more data from rakhigri itself we are doing that and the harappans has spread in part in different regions so we need data from different regions also outside the harappan region there were a lot of contemporary population 
we want to understand now the relation between Harappans and the contemporary population outside the Harappan region. Because archaeologically, it is quite clear that you know the local population and Harappans had very strong interaction also. So we want to see that also. And how it has continued, because after the Harappans, there were regional Chalkothic cultures in different regions. We want to investigate that you know, area also. Then the early Iron Age succeeded, in fact, what we call as the Megathic culture around 1200, 1300 BCE. We have skeletal data from you know, those you know, these cultural periods also. So up to second century BC, we have skeletal you know, data. So we want to understand you know, how that you know, continuity, if the continuity was there, which is indica you know, indicative, how that has happened, in fact. I always believe that the Harappans are the founders of the Indian culture. I call them as the Indian culture. Because most of the knowledge, basic knowledge, the knowledge system that they introduced, or rather perfected. The knowledge system was introduced long back, maybe 7000 BCE. But it was perfected by the Harappans around 2500 BCE. And the same tradition has continued till today. When, you know, when we excavate you know, the site of it, when we excavate, we stay there for three to four months. So during excavation, you know, whenever I used to go to the village of Rakigadi, I used to get the impression that I'm moving the Harappan village. Exactly the same lifestyle, not much change. Little change in fact in the medium of you know maybe material. Harappans have used a lot of maybe earthen pots. Today people are using maybe more metal pots. That is the only difference. But you know the you know the shape of the pots exactly same. There is no change. So there is a continuity in the food habit also. Harappans you know have introduced two important delicacies, which is very common in fact all over the world. Popular rather, chicken tandoor. We have the evidence for that, and the Indian curry. Because you know, we have the scientific you know, analysis of the content of the pots found in the burials. And we found the, content, you know, the ingredients of Indian curry. So the antiquity of Indian curry goes back to the Harappan times. So a lot of traditions were introduced. And you know, the knowledge system, in fact, I have written a book on the origin and development of the Indian knowledge system, archaeological perspective. And I have discussed about this issue that you know, how this knowledge system has and how effective that knowledge system is there even today. There are a lot of potters, in fact, who are following the same method as the Harappans did. There are people in Khamba town who are still making the replicas of the Harappan beads by using the same technology. So there is so much continuity. I can you know, go on you know, telling this. So you know, when, you know, in 2012, you know, I had a very you know, different experience. I was excavating on a you know, small site in Haryana again a place called Karsola, and we had a very uh, distinguished visitor in the form of former Prime Minister's daughter, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh's daughter, Professor Upinder Singh, uh, who was professor of history in Delhi University. She came with the students, uh, and I was showing the you know, remains to her. And in the background, there were some IS and IPS officers who were murmuring. Somebody said that, no, why these people have come all the way from, from Pune to this small village in Haryana? Maybe somebody says, you know, there's some wealth buried here. Maybe they, uh, they want to excavate that. Somebody says, you know, what a waste of the you know, of a national wealth, because this is of no use to the nation, the research that we are doing. And the last comment was very interesting. Somebody said that, you know, these people did not get an opportunity to play in the dust when they were children. They are playing now. So this is a level of understanding. And I, we don't blame the people, because it is our fault, because we have not really taken this subject to the people. And people are not really interested to know what is the history. If you say that the Harappans were so advanced, they built you know, beautiful cities, so people say, so what? So we want to understand the relevance of that, what contributions the Harappans have made to the history of South Asia, to the history of the world. That aspect you know, we want to showcase. And this is what exactly you know, this is. I'm developing a, you know, a Harappan Knowledge Center in, you know, in Rakigadi. I got a good funding from DST. And I'm going to showcase these aspects. This is what you know, people you know, are interested in knowing. So I've taken a lot of time, but this, I just wanted to you know, give you these glimpses of this. Curry so, uh, apparently didn't come to us from the Mughals.
and uh, Saraswati is important. I hope uh, those two points have been noted. And we'll come back to this because, like I said, the whole idea is to have a clear story about our origin, about ourselves. This is not so much out there about what happened 4,000 years ago, but it is about the life that we lead now and how the information about how we process the knowledge system informs pretty much everything that we do in our life. And we'll stitch this together once again, once we hear from Professor Chaube about the latest uh, in your research area. We've gone from the macro about the story of civilization to the Aryan question to what's happening in the intersection of uh, archeology span and genetics. Tell us about uh, your research findings and how they weave into this story. Namaste everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, thanks to the organizers and uh, associated people for inviting me here. Uh, let us uh, uh, start some story about uh, how I got interested in this uh, area of research. I was, uh, I wanted to be a, a scientist since uh, my childhood because I living in the village and playing cricket with uh, several kind of uh, ancestry and several kind of uh, people who are from uh, various caste groups. I wanted to, I mean, I was very fascinated to, to learn that how this caste group has originated. So, uh, but my father being a teacher, he wanted to make me a doctor and I failed twice. When I failed, then he said, okay, now you do whatever you want. And that was the great point for me to start working in this field. First I came, uh, first I went to, uh, to the Drosophila lab and I was fascinated with Drosophila. I thought that, okay, my whole life will be uh, finishing to count the eggs of Drosophila and working many techniques with Drosophila. Uh, but then suddenly I met with uh, Dr. Lalji Singh, the director of CCMB Hyderabad. And by reading the books, uh, that was 90s, the time of uh, 90, uh, 97, 98. So uh, by reading the books, uh, we used to understand that the Austroasiatics are the people who came from Africa, something like 60,000 years. They are the aborigine and still uh, Rahul Gandhi says that uh, they are the Adivasi people. And then uh, the Dravidian who came from uh, Mesopotamia, then the Aryan who came from uh, Central Asia, say, Step Belt. So these were the narratives which I used to learn from, uh, from my books. And then uh, I met uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Lalji Singh. And then I asked, sir, I wanted to check my DNA because being a Brahmin, I presume that uh, my ancestry is somewhere not in India and my ancestors are not from here. So he allowed me to go to the CCMB Hyderabad and first I took my blood, took out the DNA, then started working with that. And then the result was completely different. And that result actually driven me to start working on the Indian population. So I would, I would not hide my result. I would tell you my result. So my mitochondrial DNA, my maternal ancestry, which comes from my great, great grandmother, that has originated in India something like 65,000 years back. I am haplogroup M2. I am closest, I share closest ancestry with Koya population, a population in Andhra Pradesh, a tribal population that goes back 18,000 years. And my Y chromosome, that is paternal ancestry, that also connects to the Gotra, that shares a common ancestry with Kshatriya something like 2,500 years back from Uttar Pradesh. And that goes back uh, with 8,000 years, shares with Santhal, the tribe of Jharkhand, something like 8,000 years back. So this is the, my ancestry. And that maybe uh, then I thought maybe I'm the exception. So I started working with the Brahmins. I'm still working with the Brahmins, something like 20 years. Still, I could not finish that result. So you know the complexity of Brahmin is much more complex. So, so let us uh, let us come to the to the main point that uh, the results of uh, Indian ancestry uh, being uh, being in this area something like twenty years, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, the the narratives which has started from that Austroasiatics are the aborigine the the original people of India rest of them are the one who came later from somewhere else. Out of, uh, out of India, other parts of the world. That became wrong because Austroasiatic are, are the population who itself come, uh, came from Southeast Asia, something like 2000 BC. And 
uh, one thing uh, everyone should understand that if some population living in uh, this area and if we start comparing them with a population living in Varanasi, a population living in Kolkata. So this population would naturally show more genes with Kolkata population comparing to a population living to Varanasi. The reason is there is a phenomena in population genetics called isolation by distance model. We share more genes with our neighbors comparing to any distant neighbor. And that also applies with the genes. And at the moment, with the current research, the available data, what we see that the overall in India, the Harappan ancestry is around 60 to 65%. The hunter-gatherer ancestry that is associated with Andaman Islanders, that is around 30 to 35%. And people, they, they call that ancestry that is associated with the step belt that is also present in India, but that amount is 5 to 10%. That is more to the northwestern part of India, to the Pakistan. The region is, there is not the movement of the people. Like the people who are living, uh, living in northwestern part of India, living, people living in the Europe, if we compare with the southern part of India, the northwestern part of India would naturally share by the isolation by distance model more genes but that gene is not by the migration of the people. That is only because of the long term of the, the, the settlement process that, re, that derive the genes from one region to another region that is the gene surfing phenomena. So this 5 to 10% ancestry is, come, uh, is, is also like uh, that one can correlate with the timing of the, the several invasions like Hunas and then many, many other groups. And also, uh, this ancestry is not like one-time ancestry, except for the two population, Roars and the Jats. These two population, they share very phenomenal uh, inputs that, that could connect them with the, with the Central Asians or connect with the even uh, Latvian, Lithuanian, and Estonians. But that is a different story comparing to the other Indian populations. Thank you. So we've got the first round of perspectives from uh, uh, the multiple disciplines, uh, ranging from history to a generalist account of uh, genetics to archaeology, historical uh, excavation and genetics to population genetics. And I would, uh, I can see a larger crowd and I'm sure all of us have a lot of questions. Uh, I'd like to begin with a couple of questions that I've had for some time and then of course I'd open it up to the audience. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Vasanji first. So you, you alluded to Saraswati. And uh, we already heard from uh, uh, Els G why that period of 1500 to 1500 BC is critical to the narratives that are peddled. Uh, what is it that we know about Saraswati today? Uh, and what is the general agreement in the discipline about the uh, time when Saraswati died? I think, you know, we do not have uh, any other scientific evidence to identify this particular event. A lot of, you know, I just say that you know, a lot of geologists and even hydrologists have worked on that. But there is no, you know, clue on this particular aspect. But we can use the archaeological data to understand this particular event. See, when we talk about the Harappans, the, there are three phases of the Harappan, you know, Harappan culture. The first, the formative stage is, you know, is called the early Harappan. Now the dates of the early Harappan are going back to 6000 BCE. And we have a lot of sites in the Saraswati region. In fact, now most of the dates, early dates are coming from the Saraswati region itself. Okay, so 6000 BC is the beginning. And then, of course, now uh, there is a very good evidence. In fact, now the base, you know, the core evidence that we have used for understanding this even RN issue is the archaeological evidence. And this genetic evidence has substantiated to that. So the archaeological evidence clearly indicates that you know, there's a big, you know, maybe origin of the Harappan culture somewhere in fact in that region. And these people are growing gradually. There's a transformation which is properly reflected in the archaeological data. We have excavated that you know, from the site of Rakhigadi. And you know, uh, one example I, I will tell you that you know, Harappan town planning or the, you know, which are the Harappans are known for, that has not come suddenly. That has a very long precedence going back to 6000 BC, in the early stage people were living in small circular huts, maybe underground huts. 
In the next stage, you know, we have actually found these evidence. In the next stage, they started living on the ground, you know, in similar circular structures. Third stage, you know, they started developing the typical Harappan structures, you know, rectangular squarish. And they started producing the uh, building material like you know, bricks, you know, in proper ratio. Fourth stage, you know, there's a modicum of planning. And the fifth stage, you know, there's a full place town planning. So this is how the journey, journey is. So we get, you know, Harap, early Harappan settlements all located along the dry river, you know, bank, you know, this. And there's, you know, number of settlements. In fact, we have discovered nearly 1,500 settlements, you know, out of which you know, maybe thousands are located, in fact, along the river banks of Saraswati. Then similar number, of course, also is there, in fact, of the, you know, the advanced stage of the Harappan, you know, which is called the mature Harappan or the Harappan civilization phase. So we also find the settlements of that. But the settlements of the late phase, after 1900 BC, they started going away from the river banks. So that is a very strong indication that perhaps the river was very significant active during the early Harappan and the mature Harappan stage. And it lost its significance maybe around 1900 BCE, and therefore people are going away from that. So the archaeological, you know, you know, investigation that we have carried out, very, you know, intensive and extensive, you know, research has been carried out in this respect. And we found a large number of Harappan settlements there. And that is the area, you know, which is often described as the area of the, you know, the Aryans or the, you know, so-called the Rigvedic people. So my view is that, you no, know, I'm working on that. This is just my view that, you no, know, Harappans were the Rigvedic people. Because, you know, there's a description in fact in the Rigvedic text. And if you can, you know, match with the archaeological data, the Harappan data fits well in fact. If I have time, maybe I can explain that also. So that is a kind of, you know, uh, evidence uh, which is coming up from this. And I always believe in fact in the archaeological data. If the, we have a strong evidence, then, then you know, that evidence cannot be denied by anyone. In fact, you know, I, you know, after the publication of my research, I was invited to deliver a lecture in uh, JNU. And uh, Vice Chancellor warned me that, you know, previous week, you know, they had organized one lecture, but student did not allow that lecture to happen. So he said, be ready for that. I said that, no problem. But I also say that, you know, you invite, you know, maybe Romila Thapar and others, you know, who have, maybe who may have a lot of questions about our research. Nobody came, of course. But, uh, you know, they had sent the students with some questions written. But after the lecture, you know, everybody threw that, you know, and then went away. Because when you have a strong evidence, and here, you know, we have archaeological evidence, we have also, you know, the genetic evidence. And the last, you know, maybe he talked about the craniofacial reconstruction. We are done for the first time. That is also first time research we have done. We have shown how, how the Harappan people look like. So we have reconstructed some individuals at Rakhigadi. And the modern people and the Harappans look exactly the same. There is not difference. So when we look at this data uh, from the Saraswati region, there is a continuity from 6,000 BC till modern times. And that continuity is reflected in the archaeological data, also in the genetic data, and also in this you know, human complexion data also. So that is very strong. One, you know, one point I just wanted to make that suppose the Aryans had come from outside, then two things would have happened. They could have brought with them, you know, the cultural elements and planted here. We don't find that evidence at all. And secondly, you know, there could have been a breakage in fact in the genetic history of South Asia, if they had come in large scale. That has not happened. And therefore, you know, we certainly you know, reject, you know, this uh, Aryan migration invasion theory. Right from the early stage, right from the beginning of settled life, these people had contact with outside world. And that is also reflected in the archaeological data. We find a lot of data from different regions. Also, you know, in the Harappan population, maybe 30% is, you know, maybe, you know, typical South Asian genes. Maybe, but remaining are all mixed up, in fact. Maybe 2% Iranian, maybe 5% maybe Central Asian, 3% maybe West Asian. So mixing has happened right from the early stage. But the dominant gene, of course, is South Asian. And that has continued, you know, without any break for so many years. So this is the kind of evidence, you know, we are getting in part in the Saraswati Basin.
when your paper came out in 2019, even before I could read the paper, uh, I read the articles from Frontline and Wire. Uh, and uh, like you mentioned, uh, I think the only point that I could glean from the vast literature that you produced and the research that you created was about that one person uh, based evidence. And uh, I hope the audience today got a clarification of why that is scientific. In a specialized science, why that one person's evidence uh, is actually scientific and how that matters to us. Uh, you know, from the uh, technicalities of the research, like us to go back to Amrit and uh, figure out the philosophy of history itself. Because you've given us a clarion call. You said it's not okay if you just uh, reject the story that is given to you. You need to have a story of your own. So how do we construct the story of our own civilization? So I, I think we can use uh, as demonstration uh, what Dr. Shinde talked about. Uh, it's referred to as the Frawley paradox uh, after Sri David Frawleyji, who first pointed out this absurd paradox that on one hand we have this largest extent civilization of its time. Uh, it was larger in size than its contemporaries put together, which is the Indus Valley civilization. Uh, and we have so much material record from it. But uh, it did not speak to us, uh, uh, so to speak, because uh, its literature was absent. Uh, and the only hints of language we could find the Indus script, uh, it's still up for grabs. On the other hand, we had this vast literature called the Vedic corpus, arguably the largest uh, extent literature uh, in the world, which speaks about the same territories, which speaks about the same river. And yet we continue to pretend that they are not the same. Now, when those lenses are shed and when we are shed off those baggages of uh, prior historical analysis, uh, as Dr. Shinde said, that when we start looking at the Harappans, the Vedic people as inherently Indian and the origin of things like agriculture, things like pottery within the Indian subcontinent itself, then the same events, the same narratives that previously were flipped a different way offer new analysis. So uh, Dr. Els mentioned the battle of 10 kings uh, in the Rig Veda. Sudas. Now, uh, in, in the consensus theory, uh, he, he, he told us about how uh, the narrative was that Sudas and his people uh, are invading Aryans, battling dark-skinned uh, aboriginals. But now, if we are shed of that lens and if we understand the continuity and the autochthonous development of Indian civilization, we can actually start making quite the opposite speculations. And I say speculations because these are new territories, these are new avenues of thinking. Uh, we may take uh, some wrong uh, theorizations as well. We will shape it as we go along. But if we understand what we see in the uh, record of the Battle of Ten Kings, we find that these are all Indian tribes speaking somewhat similar dialects in conflict with each other. So in the Rig Veda, the enemies of Sudas are called Mridvach and Vadrivach, people of twisted speech, people of garbled speech. Uh, even Dr. Ambedkar actually rejected the whole theory of the uh, enemies of Sudas being aboriginals. He very rightly concluded that they were linguistically the uh, similar speaking groups. So we know that they are in conflict uh, with each other, they are all Indians. The battles are happening around the same rivers that are rivers of the Harappan maturation. So that, uh, the, Ch the Chenab River, the Jhelum River, uh, the, the battles are happening around those same rivers, even the Yamuna River, in fact. Uh, and we also find that Sudas is pushing them out of India. So therein we find that, okay, we have evidence of people for sure speaking Indo-European languages starting to migrate out of India. And the record in the Battle of Ten Kings, which is not quite a battle actually, it is a record of perhaps several campaigns by Sudas over at least two different rivers with various different tribes. It seems to appear to be a record of Harappan India. Because in Harappan India, we find various different cities. We find commonalities of weights and measures. We find commonalities of, of symbology, of pottery, material techniques. But there could very likely have been political divisions. In fact, that's one of the great mysteries about the Harappans, that who was their monarch, who was their king? Well, lo and behold, in the Rig Veda, uh, with the river evidence, with the Saraswati in the Rig Veda in Sudasa's time, lining up to be around the same kind of river of those 1500 settlements that Dr. Shinde talked about. Uh, it seems to us then 
that in the Rig Veda we find exactly the evidence of the kind of monarchs, let us use the word, the kind of imperial authorities, the kind of conquests, campaigns, conflicts that would have been played out in shaping and consolidating together what we understand as the Harappan civilization. So, this is just one line of inquiry, uh, but it shows to us how with a new lens the same facts, the same evidences can actually start to give us a different picture. Happily, uh, this is the fact that encourages us to take this line further down the road is that it lines up with the kind of evidences that Dr. Shinde talked about, that Dr. Chauve talked about uh, and yeah, so that is one example of historical narrative uh, and how we may look at it again from an Indian point of view. Are we to construct our identity only based on the contestations of chronology and battles or is there something when you say continuity, is it just a geographical and uh, human settlement related continuity or is there something about Indian civilization that is fundamentally different that it is built on a congruence of ideas and there is a definitive philosophical continuity to Bharat Varsha? I, I certainly think so. So, I mean first of all even uh, in terms of the material evidence, we have the evidence of Bagor in modern Rajasthan, 9000 BCE. So, somewhere just around that time when that great split 10,000 years ago uh, between genetic lineages might have happened. And already at that stage, uh, the archaeologists team uh, led by Dr. Kenover who investigated Bagor, they find evidence of what they call mother goddess worship. Now, uh, yes, that is a fair uh, archaeological anthropological term for it. But what it means is that we have found evidence of Murti Puja. Now, if we have found evidence of Murti Puja, we have found evidence of Dev Sthapana, of, of Pran Pratishthan, of the, of the deities. So, that very idea of living with the deities, being in engagement with the deities goes as far back as the material record is telling us. Even the conflict of the battle of 10 kings, Sudasa's Purohit, his, his chief advisor is Maitra Varuni Vasisht. Uh, and uh, in this great conflict, which is this conflict between proto-Iranians and uh, Indians, uh, we know that there was a schism in ideology where the Indians, uh, Sudasa's people were worshipping Indra uh, and Indra was primarily being invoked uh, and Varun became uh, the deity that is being invoked by the Anavs, by the proto-Iranians. Uh, Varun is remembered by them even in modern Zoroastrianism as Ahur Mazda, which is Ahur Asur Med. But in the hymns of uh, Maitra Varuni Vasisht, Indra and Varun are being together invoked. They are being together called and you see a clear attempt of trying to bridge over these material uh, conflicts and material divisions between people at a higher order, at the order of deities, at the order of Vedic hymnology and at the order of then for of culture and ideas. Uh, so that kind of synthesis definitely we find the underpinnings wherever we, we look. We get a clue about why the political narrative of eradication of Sanatana Dharma is just that. It is just a political compulsion. It is a naive conception. It is an immoral one. Because there is not just a historical continuity, but there is more importantly and more critically a philosophical, a cultural, a spiritual continuity to Bharat. And the divisions that are invoked today for political compulsions have no basis on the founding values of this civilization. So, I open it up for the questions from audience uh, from that perspective. The reason we learn about history, the reason we learn about all the dif different disciplines that make up this complex argument is not so much about getting stuck in the technicality of it, but it is the ability to look at all of these things together to mould our own lives, not just the personal life, but also the collective life. Like I said, we have given you, we have bequeathed you a society of very rich complexity. But it also means that we need to give you the means to navigate it and stitch a decent life for all of us. So, with that spirit, I open it up for questions. Uh, uh, you can tell us what your question is. I request the organizers to help me with this. Uh, who is your question to? And make it brief. Uh, it, it's brevity is one of the hallmarks of our civilization. This is, after all, the civilization that has given us the sutra form. So, keep it brief and keep it specific. So, uh, my question is to the larger panel and not to an individual per se. So, history is always written from the perspective of the victor and, uh, and that is from Ramayana onwards. You gave lot of examples wherein whether you know you wanted to publish the story earlier, but you published it later so that you know, there is Harvard related validation. Similarly, even in our society, 
there is bias that we have inherited through you know years of foreign rule when i want to review a paper even at the iit i am encouraged to review a paper from taylor and francis versus a indian author so what you the distinguished panel are doing to advocate change in this bias and that is something that we actually need to in order to understand our own genesis and that's the advocacy for change i think it's a fantastic and a very critical question uh, the fact that we have dr elst here on the stage is in fact uh, an illustration of what needs to happen i request uh, dr elst to talk about it first and then i'll share my perspective from a outsider in uh, uh, dimension of indian knowledge systems and what needs to be the road map for iks well i'm not uh, going to advise you people what you should do but um the stuff that i see happening in recent years is very much in the right direction you see for some 20 years i was very frustrated that in india people stayed at a level of you know fulminating against political motives and so on you see whatever the motives are they're not important because they don't decide the outcome you know what are the contents wise arguments the back then the linguistic and the archaeological now also the genetic arguments now there i see a sea change i see with the uh, younger people like um like ashish kulkarni for example uh yajni avedam and so on and so they have this open this true interdisciplinary spirit you see also in the west just like here there's a lot of lip service to interdisciplinary approaches but very few people do it and sometimes thinking that they're being very progressive like for example in uh, a europeanist indo-europeanist conference in leiden last year one speaker talked about the semitic influence in the irish language this is a very esoteric topic don't worry uh, but so a number of linguists famous linguists even have worked on this for decades and so they show that in irish less so in welsh there is a lot of influence of phoenician which is similar to today's arabic so linguistically this seemed to make sense now he had learned from geneticist friends that there are no mediterranean genes in ireland so he decided oh yeah there can't be any linguistic influence from phoenician because there were never phoenicians there now come on you see this means that all these linguists had worked for nothing their all their findings are just thrown away see now that is an example of how you should not do it you see when seemingly two different sciences point to different results yes phoenicians in ireland long ago no no phoenicians in ireland then you have a little problem but for for scientists this is not very serious okay you look deeper you look again and so on to finally you'll be able to harmonize these two lines of research you know the, the solution is not to just throw away the findings of one science and in this case of your own science you see because for a long time we, we've seen the problem that you know people with linguists threw away the findings of archaeology or vice versa here you have a linguist who throws away the findings of linguistics because of his all for this new science of genetics so that's how it should not be done now it is younger generation not just the westerners of indians you see who for a long time were very clumsy in their dealing with these different types of evidence now i find that they strike a very good balance taking into account the types of evidence offered by the different sciences linguistics of course is a pretty technical thing but i know no already since talageri's contribution that common sense goes a long way you see to deal with this linguistic evidence very often just just looking at it in in a, in a practical manner already gives you a lot of answers you see many of these very professional linguists in the west do not see the forest because of the trees 
They look so much at the details that they lose the larger picture. So here I see much less and less of that. This is uh, one complement to Indians. I also have to mention, I'll stop with that, um, the contribution of a few foreigners. And here I think very especially of the Russian Alexander Semenenko. I, he has done enormous work the last few years. In two respects, one is the uh, connection between the Vedic evidence and the Harappan evidence, what you people have talked about. So he finds a lot of things that you know, visuals in Harappa that correspond to descriptions in the Rig Veda. And then secondly, and that I think is even more decisively, because you see connecting Harappa with the Vedas that many of you are doing. And so this is something really new. You see, Indian archaeologists have done a great job in showing that there is no evidence at all for this Aryan invasion. But that's not enough. We also need evidence that there was an emigration. There was a movement in the opposite direction. And so, so far, nobody did that. You know, few of the Indian archaeologists were working in, you know, Afghanistan, Russia, and so on. I mean, this is all understandable, but nevertheless, it was a problem. And so, you see, now he starts showing the Harappan presence, you know, in, in Kazakhstan, in Arabia, in Mesopotamia and so on, you can see that for them, this whole Central Asian, West Asian area was their backyard. And so obviously, when a crisis happened in India, whether an ecological cri climatic crisis has probably happened, but also political crises, that it was very obvious that a large percentage of Indian people went to Central Asia. And if 1% of the people in thickly populated Harappa goes to thinly populated Central Asia, then they make a huge difference there. And so you see there he shows materially how this effectively happened, how there are many signs of Indians going outside. The same has been shown at the genetic level by, for example, our botanist friend, uh, Premendra Priyadarshi, where he shows, I think you have shown similar things, that several species were brought by human beings outside. And so you find the genes of Indian cows in the cow population of Syria, of Ukraine, even of Italy. And so clearly, you see, cows don't migrate by themselves. In this case, they will have to cross the Hindu Kush mountains. Now, Maybe goats could do it, but cows will never do it. You see, they only go there because they're being, you know, guided, they're goaded there by human beings. So yes, you see, there is definitely an emigration. My question is that uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion and narrative going on, like uh, people from south uh, part of India and people from north part of India, they think that we are, we, we are different. And uh, yeah. we like the color, tone, or uh, many different aspects. They feel that they are different. And they, there may be a political advantage. People are looking out of it. So what the archaeological perspective, uh, historical perspective, and linguistic perspective says behind these uh, discussions? And my second question is, what was the uh, economic affluence, condition of the economic affluence before pre-Vedic era based on the evidence uh, found in the archaeological uh, excavations. Thank you. I think the, uh, the complexion of the people uh, varies from region to region. It has nothing to do with the uh, you know, DNA of the people, right? DNA is same. The complexion varies because of the geographical factor, climatic factor, food habit of the people. And with whom, you know, they have got more mixing. For example, people living from, you know, in southern part of India, they have more mixing from Southeast Asia, Africa. Whereas people living in the northern part has more, you know, maybe mixing with Iranians and Central Asians. Because of that, people look slightly different. So the, otherwise, you know, DNA is same. And also our research indicates that the Harappan influence has spread, you know, spread, you know right from maybe Kashmir to up to Tamil Nadu. Over this area, in fact, now we can see the uniformity 
uh, in the mature culture. There's a regional diversity is there, of course. Within Harappan region also, there is a lot of regional diversity. But the unity in diversity is there right from the Harappan times. So we are, you know, continuing with this particular tradition till today. So this misunderstanding has to go because of the scientific data that we have now. And what was your yeah, next? Points. Harappans particularly, I tell you that uh, Harappans could grow and develop into urban phase because of the economic prosperity, basically. But that was created by the Harappans. That opportunity was created by the Harappans. They had a lot of disadvantage because a lot of resources that were required for making maybe basic craft that was located outside the Harappan region, controlled by the local population. For example, copper always came from Khetri region. And that was controlled by the you know, local charcoal farmers there. Gold came from South India, from Hatti mines, right? From the scientifically proved. That was controlled by the, you know, what we call as the southern Neolithic people. So they were all contemporary. And Harappans developed, you know, good contact with these people, very cordial contact. In fact, you know, there is an indication for, at Farmana that even Harappans have maybe established matrimonial alliance with the contemporary population outside the Harappan region also. Harappans are technology with them. So they imported, you know, these raw materials from them. And they started producing the finished goods on large scale, and they started supplying the finished goods to, to the same people from whom they, they acquired the raw material. So this all you know, gradually you know, they started you know, increasing their prosperity. And then at one stage that they realized that they need to go beyond Indian subcontinent also. And that is how you know, the Harappans were the first in fact in the world to develop the maritime contact for the trade purpose. So they developed contact with, uh, with uh, you know, Persian Gulf region, with Oman, Bahrain, Mesopotamia, up to Egypt. And literally, you know, the Harappans were plundering the, you know, these people, in fact. They were sending a lot of goods there. And return, you know, very few goods were coming from that side. So a lot of, you know, wealth was generated by the Harappan people. And that wealth was used by the Harappan for the development of cities and, and towns. Harappans have used this wealth for the common welfare of the common people. There's a difference between Harappans and the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians. Egyptians said, you know, Whatever development happened, they had the proper kingdom system, monarchical system. So all the development happened along the you know monarchical, monarchical system only. We see a lot of pyramids, you know those ziggurats, you know big temples, and the impression that we get that is you know maybe most of the Indians feel that you no know, Harappans were not capable of developing or building you no know, pyramids or the ziggurats. Let me tell you that Harappans were much more competent and they were considered the best civil engineers. If they had decided, they could have easily created that, those type of monuments. But they, their philosophy was different. They knew that you know, this is of no use to the common people. So a lot of wealth was brought, and that was used for the cultural development. So that is how the Harappans have grown, in fact, like this. So there is a lesson to learn, in fact. I always give the, you know, we See, always we see that you know, this knowledge has not confined to Indian subcontinent, it has gone beyond that also. And I always give the example of Japan. I've seen the you know, destruction at Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and nobody thought that Japan will rise again. But you know, Japan rose within 15 years. They showcased you know, the economic power during the Tokyo Olympic in 1964. And the you know, the strategy that was adopted by Japanese was exactly the same as the Harappans. Japan had the technology with them. They started importing raw materials from India, China, developing countries. They produced you know, a lot of finished goods, supplied the finished goods to the same people, same countries from whom they acquired the raw material. That is how Japan could rise, you know. So there is so much to learn from the ancient cultures. It is not that only simply study them. But we have to learn, in fact, a lot from them also. So this is important. Each of that is a potential PhD topic, every single statement that we just heard. Uh, good evening, professors. Uh, I'm a PhD scholar from Civil Engineering Department. I have two small questions. The first question is, sir, I was a Kinder Vidyalaya student, and I studied history books. Whatever I studied in the history books and whatever the discussion that happened here are conflicting, sir, and you would surely agree. So I would like to know, until when we will expect this research, which is available in the research literature, will be reflected in the CBSC and CRT textbooks. Second question. Sir, uh, recently one heated argument occurred regarding the name of this country, India Bharat. 
sir uh, i would like to know whether it's a political stunt or there exists some historical logic as per the indian genesis thank you i'm sure these questions are uh, animating all of us on the first part uh, i think that can be nestled within the larger imagination and the paradigm that we're talking about the indian knowledge systems and the road map for indian knowledge systems so we'll get to that the second question i'd like amrut to respond to about uh, the india versus bharat and because that's uh, that's actually linked to the spiritual phys- philosophical idea of bharat whether that's linked to one event or uh, do we have a larger imagination well uh, to begin even the word india uh, there are theories that talk about chinese travelers coming to india and talking about the name of the country then also being intu uh, which is indu uh, indu meaning the moon and uh, chandrama or the moon uh, being a metaphor for light light being the primarily primary thing that our civilization has chased uh, it is expressed in asatoma sadgamay tamasoma jyotirgamay uh, in fact as uh, dr shinde said that we did not build pyramids but if we look at the rigveda and our literature uh, those were I- I- I monuments of sound and knowledge uh, so that that kind of light so india the word itself also could be related to that let us say it is not and let us say that sure it comes from a river uh, indus and from that river which we called sindhu our nearest neighbors call, started calling hindu and a bit distant neighbors then called indus i personally uh, am not as averse to it just because of that uh, i mean yes all of us are referred to by a name our parents give to us we don't choose but so many of us uh, especially in college life start going by the names our friends give to us and they may be very different and uh, very corrupted from what our parents might have envisioned so that becomes a matter then of choice convenience uh, alliance ship and things like that i don't think we need to be uh, as uh, animated about it especially because no one's doubting that we are also bharat uh, that is enshrined in our constitution it's not a new thing that ma- the new trend cycle was new then when we look at bharat also uh, it comes from the root bhri uh, which uh, lends to us even the word bhrigu now bhri uh, uh, it, it means to bear it means to sustain it means to carry forward uh, and bhrit then becomes that which is sustained that which is carried forward from bhrit comes bharat which means the one who sustains the one who carries fro- forward and from bharat comes bharat that which is sustained that which is carried forward so eternally the the symbol of symbology the theme is of carrying the agni forward it is the civilizational yajna that is enshrined both in bharat the word uh, and also in hindu uh, if we choose that to be the etymology for india so to me that is the level at which i would like to self define ourselves uh, beyond anything else so get to the spirit and the spiritual principle that operates india uh, the new cycles and the animated 9 pm debates will continue but if we can resolve to be the bearers of that light that is the pursuit of all of this study another arrive of you point personally i do think that uh, india is the greek pronunciation of the persian word hindu of which al hind is the arabic pronunciation and into is the chinese pronunciation and ultimately it all comes from sindhu and it just means river and with bharat i agree with your etymology of the name bharata however it's not that etymology that is the reason why this country was named after him you know the country was named after him simply because he was important and uh, why was he important well you see why is this not called kurukshetra you see kuru was also an important king the field of kuru is that not a good name for this country well no because all the important kings you see chandra gupta and whatever they could not match in importance that what king bharata has done you see king bharata is the one at whose court starts the vedic tradition his adopted son bharadwaj was his court priest he started the first hymn not the first hymn i mean poetry in, in even primitive cultures already exists but the first that got the vedic treatment that was learned by heart passed on in great detail with protected by all kinds of mnemo techniques and so on 
to the next generation and so on. Then it became the, the backbone of a whole system of concomitant sciences and so on. So it got a great prestige. It was more or less divinized, seen as a divine revelation and so on. But so all this was started by King Bharata. So Bharat means his dynasty, means of Bharata. So it refers to his dynasty and the country controlled by his dynasty, or ultimately the country guided by his cultural influence. Because the, the political um, expansion does not go very far. It's mainly King Sudas with his Ten Kings battle, who you know, enlarges it from like the Northwest Frontier Province to about what is now Lucknow or so, Western uh, Uttar Pradesh, and not much else. It doesn't reach as far as Gujarat, that's where, you know, Krishna sets up shop and it doesn't reach South India at all. However, um, after that, the cultural expansion begins and very peacefully, Initially, they had conquered, you know, Punjab and so on. Here, it goes peacefully because all the kings in the south, to enhance their own prestige, they want to be part of this big new thing, this Vedic tradition. So they import families specialized in the Vedas, give them these agraharas, you know, tax facilities and so on, so that they can spread the Vedic tradition. And this way, all of India becomes Bharat Varsh. Now, what does the name Bharat Varsh mean? And it'll shock you. It's so communal, you see. It means Veda land. I'll just, uh, to add to it, so not just the Bharat tribe, some weird uh, coincidences in all of our history. The Bharat tribe itself uh, coming from the Purus, they're the Puru Bharats. Uh, in, the, in the Vedic record and in the historical record, the Purus uh, came before, they came first. Uh, lo and behold, that is what Pu, uh, the root of Purus, uh, it means to purify uh, and it means to, to be ahead. That is what leads to the words Purohit, placed in front. That is what leads to the word Puja. Uh, so the, lo and behold, the people who came first are also named after the root that evokes the people who came first. Uh, for a while, the Bharats are allied to the tribe that are called the Anus. Uh, lo and behold, Anu actually means alongside, side by side. Uh, it is found in so many words, Anuvad, uh, to Samvad. Uh, Bhrigu, uh, who is said in the Rig Ved to be the one who introduces us to the fire. He brings the Agni to the Aryans. Uh, the root Bhrig, it's the cackling sound that fire makes or wood makes as it's burning. Uh, Yadus, uh, in, in the Dashrajniya itself, the battle of ten kings, sometimes enemies, sometimes allies, Yadi, uh, that doubt, it's uh, embedded in their name itself. Uh, Turvashas and Druhuyus, Druh means to cut. Uh, lo and behold, the enemies are called Druhuyus itself. And then after the Bharats, uh, under the Kurus, when the final expansion happens, the establishment happens, to do, Kuru uh, literally means to act, to create. So our history uh, is actually telling us something more than just the political uh, level uh, in all these names, in fact. Thank you so much. Uh, just in conclusion, uh, you know, because all of these different strands uh, are coming to us because like we discussed the tales, like Amrit said, the grandparents have given us do not match with the story education is giving us, which means that the reclamation of that identity has to begin with the reclamation of the philosophy of education itself. And that is what we are seeing with the idea of Indian knowledge systems. This institution has pioneering work uh, much before IKS became a theme. IKS was an established part of the IIT Karakpur uh, institutional building process. So I'd request all of you to engage with the paradigm of Indian knowledge systems. Understand how do we advance that. It obviously needs all of us to come together from a multidisciplinary lens. But it also needs for us to have a similar strong identity and a story to cohere around. So the story of the culture and the story of the knowledge system that can then feed us uh, our dreams of pushing forward are both related. And that is also, like I said, uh, when I introduced Bruhat, our idea of cultural storytelling, knowledge systems and leadership is essentially in the service of the civilizational flourishing. Thank you so much.